Uh, the song you've just heard, um, I'll speak a bit more about it in a moment, it's actually sung in Turkish, I hope that was clear, um, but it's an old Turkish, as sung in the Danube Delta um, from long ago. It was actually translated for me by a student at the University of uh, Eskeshi here in um, Turkey, and I'll show a slide in a moment with with the translation of it when I get to that point in the narration, but I had wanted to play some music right at the beginning. There are several songs to play with. Um, so, once again, thank you very much for coming this evening. I'll, can everyone hear? Do I need the microphone? Do I need the microphone? I do, yes. I also, I'll try and stand here. Good. Um, the Danube means many things to many people. It's a Roman river, it's a Greek river, it's a German river, it's a Hungarian river, but it's also a Turkish river. And I was uh, especially grateful to Gönül for arranging for me to come here this evening and for encouraging me to try to speak about the Turkish Danube, which is one of the less known Danubes in Europe. Um, and I should also explain that my own interest in the river sort of starts in the East. I um, first had the idea of writing this book um, while flying back to Budapest from Nairobi and I was following far below me in the desert the line from the window of the plane at 30,000 feet, the line of the, of the Nile. And, uh, and then I dozed off as we were crossing the Mediterranean and woke up again to see another river, what seemed to be a continuation of the Nile, but which of course turned out to be the Danube. So from Nairobi to Budapest, I, could, I sort of followed what could be said to be the Nile all the way home, or perhaps the Nile is the upper Danube, or perhaps the Danube is the lower Nile. So this was one of, of several inspirations to write the book. Another is that living in Eastern Europe for more than half of my life, I've often been struck by a certain arrogance of Western Europe or of Northern Europe towards the East. There's a sense, I think, also in previous books I've read on the Danube of um, people stumbling, often British writers, German writers, Italian writers stumbling out of a cafe somewhere in the Black Forest after having drunk one cup of coffee too many one Black Forest Gatto too many and sensing as they go down the river towards the Black Sea that they're heading into a more and more barbarian, a less and less civilized um, part of the world. And for myself as an Englishman, but living and having fallen in love with Eastern Europe quite early on in my life, I um, often have a sense of wanting to redress that balance a little bit. and to set out from the Black Sea, as Gernal said, and travel up the river. I'm trying in the book to portray a different vision of Europe as well, to use the Danube as a device, if you like, to see Europe as people coming from the East, Turkish people, Bulgarian people, Romanian people, Hungarians might, traveling up the river. And as I traveled up the river, I discovered that while rivers flow inevitably downstream from the mountains to the sea. I found the footsteps on the shores of the river, because I should add that I didn't really travel much. When I had an opportunity, I traveled by boat. Um, and the backbone of the book is a, is a journey over one year, from 2012 to 2013, upriver all the way. But I traveled mainly on the banks of the river by car, by bicycle, on foot, by any means of transport I could find. And um, I found the footsteps on the shore, on the banks of the river, facing the same way that I was traveling. Because of course in history people tend to migrate or travel, whether they be traders or migrants or soldiers or mercenaries or simply adventurers. They tend to travel, um, in this case, upriver into the heart of Europe, the dark heart of Europe, perhaps, in modern Germany. So that's my starting point, really, with the river. And 
one of the symbols of that. We should work out how to work this. Um, is there a little um, Alpes? Alpes is still? He's disappeared. Okay. Uh, just like one of the counters. He's downstairs. Okay, I'll, I can do it like this. We'll try and find it. Yes, good. The shape of the Danube here. And I'd like to start, obviously, right over here in the east with Dobroja, the good land in Slavic etymologies. And this is an area where it's the only part of the river where the Danube actually flows, as you can see here. Obviously, it's coming in real life from the east, flowing westwards and southwards. But here, for the, it's the only section of the river which flows north. And it flows north because it meets the granite mountains, the Machin Mountains here, and before it finds a way east, finally, into the Black Sea. And this area trapped between the river and the Black Sea is called Dobroja, which of course was a very important province of the Ottoman Empire. And in the delta of the river, Uh, this, is, this is the start of the river in the Black Forest. But this is part of my tale because I imagined I was traveling from the Black Sea to the Black Forest, but I discovered in, and this is the Black Forest, as you can see the Danube's little more than a stream here. But as I traveled, um, and the next slide, there's a bit of there's a slight delay on it. This is the mouth of the river flowing out into the Black Sea, it's actually here, this is one of the southernmost mouth of the river flowing out in, into the Black Sea there. But I discovered, uh, and this is the slide I was really looking for, um, just coming up now, um, I discovered that it's, um, this is an oak tree at a place called Kara Orman, which the Turks in the audience will of course know means Black Forest. And so, and this is a village um, and uh, an, a, a plantation of ancient oak trees in the Danube Delta. Oak trees growing out of sandbanks. And I never really realized, having grown up in England, that oaks can grow out of sand. So, to cut a long story short, the river actually flows from the Black Forest to the Black Forest, from Kara Orman to Kara Orman. Um, the is is some um, help there? Because I would really like. Um, do you think we could ask just so I could operate a small one? Um, just before he comes. So this is an area of, this is the delta itself. It's the biggest reed banks on earth. Um, and you can see here the three branches of the river flowing out into the sea. The southernmost one, the central one, Sulina, and the northern, the Kilia branch of the river. And obviously as an sort of area of migration for birds um, as the most important, one of the most important Areas. Yeah, is there anything I can um, hold to make the slides move? Or do I have to do it from here? Okay, so I'll just do it. Yeah, okay. I wanted to talk about Dobroja, which is this area, as I said, showed on the previous slide, with between the Danube, where it flows to the north, and the Black Sea, an area trapped between the Danube and the Black Sea. And uh, this is an area, a province of the Ottoman Empire, which from 1417 till um, 1878, till the Treaty of San Stefano, was part of the Ottoman Empire. And still today, 80,000 Tatars and Turks live there in Dobroja. It's a very multicultural area, multi-ethnic area, because also during the Ottoman Empire, it was a, a place of refuge.
French for different communities. Um, in the 15th century for Sephardic Jews from Spain. In the 17th century for the old believers, Russian Orthodox uh, believers fleeing the Orthodox reforms in Russia of Patriarch Nikon. And the, both the Christians and the Jews found a haven in the Ottoman Empire and especially settled in Dobrodja, which is still an area of um, Romanians, Bulgarians, the southern Dobrodja um, is still part of northern Bulgaria today on the coast. So it was always a, a multi-ethnic place. Um, Sulina, a town right on the um, edge of the Danube. This is the side I was looking for. So this is from, this is an ethnic map from the late 19th century. You'll see that actually very few, although it had just become part of Romania, the actually very few Romanians living there at that time. The Bulgarians in purple, the Tatars in brown, and the pink areas are being largely Turkish. So it's to this day extremely interesting uh, part of Europe, a rather surprising part with many mosques and minarets to this day, uh, with towns with names like Babadag, the Mountain of the Fathers, Eshtepe, Five Hills, Mahmudia, Sarayu, Topalu, little villages today um, with mixed populations. And obviously in that period of 460 years, uh, when it was part of the Turkish Empire, of the Ottoman Empire, this has left a very strong feeling in the air. The landscape is rather wild, it's rather like the, the steps to the north of the Black Sea. Um, and if we look at the next slide, this is the, um, the lighthouse in the town of um, Sulina, which is, as I said before, right at the end of the, uh, the central mouth of the river. The Herodotus, the Greek historian, wrote of ten mouths of the Danube. Now there are only three, thanks to the river regulations of the 19th and 20th century. But actually the measurement of the river is from this lighthouse. So while most rivers are measured from the source, the Danube is measured from my direction, from, um, from the delta, from the mouth of it. And another sense of the landscape, the rather remarkable landscape of the Danube delta area. The song, yeah, let me tell you, I'd like to read you from um, the, how I came across the songs in the town of Torcha, which is the first town in the sort of D of the Delta. On a Sunday morning, in a Sunday, on a Sunday morning in Torcha, I go in search of the Imam at the mosque a little way up the hill towards the museum. He's rushing to a funeral, but we'll be back later and we can talk then, God willing. But God has other plans for him, and at the appointed time, there's no one in sight. After a brief wait in the cold of a March evening, I ring the doorbell at the Turkish-Romanian Friendship Association opposite, a low townhouse of just a single story. The Turks governed Dobroja for nearly 500 years and only lost their territories here, in the 1870s. The remaining Turks have been transformed from rulers to an ethnographic oddity, but they've kept some of their treasures intact. A woman comes to the door and welcomes me inside like a prodigal son. A Turkish women's group has gathered for their weekly singing session. Reza Sadullah, Sabis Mahmet, and Sabiha Ali lead the troop. Some of the songs they've learned on their annual trips to the Turkish heartlands which they perform at folk festivals, but the best are old Turkish ballads from Dobroja about the Danube. And here's the one that I played right at the beginning. Um, I don't know if you can read the words, but... Uh, um, yeah. But rather, can you read the words? Would you like me to read them? Yeah, I think I can read them. Yeah, this is a particularly beautiful song, I thought. 
um, why a Romanian lass would feel homesick beside the Danube, and where the Turkish lad had arrived from remained hidden in the mists of time. Tulcea was always a town for people in transit. It looked out towards the sea and back up the Danube. After four or five songs, the ladies are carrying, and one has lost her mobile phone. Soon the whole group is hunting high and low for it, and even the final chorus falls victim to the disappearance of the new technology. A little bit like this evening, in my case. Uh, back in the small hotel in the harbour, I eat another perch, then have an early night, lulled to sleep by the sound of waves lapping against the harbour and the cries of gulls. The second reading I'd like to do for you this evening is um, from the town of Babadak. In a moment, I'm going to hopefully find... Uh -huh. This, you'll see in a moment, is... Memnune. The snowdrops of Baba Doug, Memnunia tells me sternly, have the most beautiful scent. But what do they actually smell of, I ask her, casting aside a lifetime of certainty that while snowdrops may have many other qualities, they are certainly odorless. Freshly laundered linen on a winter's day, she says confidently. She serves cups of strong black Turkish coffee as we sit in her neat middle-class living room discussing Sari Saltuk. And I should explain that the reason I went to Babadag was Sari Saltuk. Um, the father in the name, Babadag, is Sari Saltuk, who arrived here with 40 warriors by flying carpet from central Anatolia, according to one source, to convert Dobroja to Islam. Many wonders are told about him, not least that he saved the daughter of the king of Dobroja from a dragon and cut off its seven heads with his wooden Bektashi sword. And I wonder, when I heard this story, if the seven heads of the dragon might not have been, at that time, the seven mouths of the river. A peculiar variant of the story suggests that a Christian monk claimed credit for this feat in order to win the hand in marriage of the king's daughter, the prize announced by her father for anyone who could rid him of the dragon. Sari Salta proposed to the monk an ordeal by fire to find out which of them was telling the truth about the defeat of the dragon. They were both boiled alive in the same cauldron, suspended over the flames. The monk perished in agony while Sari Salta emerged unscathed. In other legends, he is paired with St. Nicholas, the patron saint of the children. And my own interest in Sari Salta had begun in Bosnia many years before, where because Sari Saltuk, when he died, as a, as a figure part of legend and, and part clearly based on truth, he was buried in seven places. And I've so far managed to visit three of his graves. Uh, one in Bosnia, at a place called Lagai, where the river Buna comes out of a, of a cliff face, fully formed. Uh, another in Albania, in the mountains, overlooking the Adriatic. And so in Baba Daik I met, um, I visited the third tomb of Sari Sultan. The others, there's one in Edirne, I believe, in Turkey and, and in several other places. Um, so I was directed towards Memnune, who I've just introduced, by people in the village. I just asked in the street, who can tell me about Sari Sultan? And so she was the most knowledgeable woman in the um, village, in the town, which is actually a rather handsome town. She's a matronly woman with intelligent brown eyes and a passion for flowers and history. Sadi Saltuk's grave disappeared for a while, she tells me, only to be rediscovered by a man called Koyun Baba while walking with his sheep. Koyun means sheep in Turkish. Baba Dug was once threatened by a huge flood pouring from a hole in the ground, but Koyun Baba saved the community by pushing barrow loads of cotton into the hole. The British Orientalist F.W. Hasluck mentions another Bektashi saint, Pambuk Baba, who seems to have succeeded or to be identical with the Bektashi saint, Koyun Baba. Pambuk means cotton in Turkish. Both men were disciples, like Sari Saltuk of Haji Bektash, 
the founder of the Bektashi order of dervishes, the mystical order most closely associated with the Janissaries, the elite of the Ottoman, of, of the Ottoman armies. There are still Bektashi strongholds in Albania and Macedonia. Mishkin Baba from the island of Adakale in the, in the Danube and Gul Baba, still honoured upstream in Budapest, were also Bektashis. And once when as a journalist I was covering the war in Macedonia, uh, we visited uh, the uh, Bektashi monastery which still survives there. And at one point the um, head of the order took us to Asked, said, journalism is a dangerous um, profession, isn't it? And we had to admit that occasionally it was. And he took us into the prayer room of the of the teke, the tekia, and uh, and passed his wooden beads over each of our head three times while saying the prayer. And I've certainly felt um, a lot safer ever since. <laughs> This is um, Mamnunis sister-in-law, who took us to see the Sari Saltuk um, And here is the tomb of um, Goyum Baba, up on the hill. The local gypsies, the Roma, are Muslims in Baba Dag, and they, despite the admonitions of the Imam not to worship the dead or to pay homage to the dead, they go up there in the spring each year and hang bits of cloth on all the bushes, so you can see the grave there of Koyun Baba. And uh, there's a, actually a plaque in Romanian and in Turkish saying it's uh, forbidden by Islam to um, <coughs> worship or address the dead. But as you can see, the okay. local gypsies in Roma won't have any of that and are determined to establish their own relationship. It's rather a, a, a tall climb, a rather strenuous climb up the hill to the tomb of, of Koyun Baba. I'd like to jump ahead to... Ah, oh, here we are. And here is the tomb of Sali Saltuk. One of the many tombs <coughs> of Sali Saltuk in Baba Dag. This is the Danube. One hears and I suppose because of Johannes Strauss, the, um, one imagines the Danube as a blue river. This is the river, I've seen it many colours. My own favourite was silver, but this um, is at the Ruse in Bulgaria. Uh, just at dawn, in fact, it looks like sunset. But uh, here, at this point, because of the curves um, uh, in the river, it, uh, Gunnar put out a map at the back from her own journey up the river, but in that you can, it looks rather straight, but in fact at this point the sun rises uh, obviously over to the east and you can see that, like it's, I would often on my journey see the sun rising into it, the sun setting into it, um, it's one of the beauties of, of travelling the whole length of a, of a river. This is a Nikopol in Bulgaria, site of Nowadays, it's rather an industrial town, but a site of uh, many battles, um, as one would guess from the Nikopol town of victory in Greece. And here, I'd like to dwell for a moment on Adakale, on the island of Adakale, a Turkish <coughs> island in the river at the Iron Gates. This was... Um, a, a, a place of particular beauty obviously means the island of the fortress and um, but many peace treaties through the ages as the Ottoman Empire was broken up or collapsed, Adakale was forgotten, it was such a small island so there was a time when it just became a little corner of Turkey in the middle of the Danube um, eventually it was remembered, it was part of um, Hungary briefly uh, after 1878 and um, it had a particularly beautiful, um, his, I think the next one coming is of the main street. Uh, but as you can see from where it lies in the river, right out in the middle of a, of a wide bend, just before the Danube flows through 
or rather coming downriver just after it flows through the um, what's called the Iron Gates, which is where the Carpathian Mountains meet the Balkan Mountains. You can see there the tall um, cypress trees and poplars on the island. It was also a place where uh, Mishkin Baba, another of the Bektashi uh, saints, uh, ended up after um, he was guided there by a dream. And here, the main street. Um, it was famous for its pistachio ice cream, for its fig jam, for its pomegranates. Um, the only non-Turkish person living there um, in the late 19th century was the baker. It was a Romanian baker for some reason. And the sadness of Adakale is that it no longer exists. That the dam, in fact this is what that part looks like now. That's where the island used to be. The Iron Gate Dam, uh, built by communist Yugoslavia, by Tito and by Nicolae Ceausescu, the leader of Romania, communist Romania, in 1968, raised the river level by 30 meters. And before they raised the river level, obviously they needed to destroy the island so it wouldn't be a hazard for shipping. And I'd like to read to you from, because it had happened so relatively recently, as I was traveling up, it, um, up, up the river 40 years after Adakale was destroyed in 1968, well, between 1968 and 71, I went in search of people who had lived on Adakale and still found several. Ahmed Engor was born on the island of Adakale in the middle of the snake-like zigzag the river performs after breaking through the confines of the Iron Gate. He fell in love and was married there in 1967 to an island girl a year before the island was destroyed. His father came from Bosnia. Adakale was a beautiful place. I remember the fruits, best of all, and the floods. The streets were often underwater in spring. Even now I dream I go to the island by boat, set foot on, on it and walk there. My memories come back walking up and down the island, just as it was in my mind. We talk in the yard of his house while his wife, Miora, makes Turkish coffee. The family are Turks, like almost all the former inhabitants of the island. Adakale was a time bubble, with its mosque and minaret, its old fortress. The name means the island of the fortress, and its protected status between the Ottoman and the Austro-Hungarian empires. Less than two kilometers long and three to four hundred meters wide, it was in Turkish hands from the 14th to the 20th centuries, for all but the 20 years from 1718 to 1739. That was long enough for the Austrians to rebuild and reinforce the handsome brick fortress, probably on the foundations of a Roman one, which allowed the Turkish garrison to control the river traffic in both directions. At the Congress of Berlin in 1878, when Serbia won her independence, Bulgaria was prevented from emerging as a major Balkan state. Romania received northern Dobroja, and the island was so tiny it was completely forgotten. It remained under Turkish rule even when the left bank returned to Romanian control. Eventually, Romania took it over, but the island remained always special, with its own microclimate, its figs and pomegranates. Trips there were especially popular with children for the pistachio-flavoured ice cream. Action films were made. Ahmed remembers having a brandy with one of the famous actors. I drank one to his three. His task was to stand guard over the camera equipment while they were filming. I was even paid, he said. Ahmed attended primary school on the island until he was aged 11, then went to boarding school in Oshawa, just across the straits. When his father died, the family could no longer afford the cost of boarding. He tried another school, then left. If you can't study, you'd better learn to row, because there'll always be work on an island for those who can row, they told him. So that was his first job, rowing the children to the school he no longer attended in the mornings and back home in the afternoons. It took about 10 minutes, more when the water was high. The key was to stay as close as possible to the bank, then cross at the shortest point. 
waiter in Turnu Severin. He remembers a meeting of top Romanian and Yugoslav communist officials and how, just as he was bringing them their after-lunch coffee, one of the Yugoslav comrades asked what would happen if the people refused to move from the island. Then we will just flood it anyway, and they will run like rats, said the Romanian minister gleefully. He managed to go back to the island only once, on a military boat on which the soldiers travelled to lay dynamite around the buildings. He was on the shore in Orshava, drinking brandy when they lit the fuse. It was as though they declared war on the island, on nature itself. The minaret fell only halfway and stayed at an angle of 45 degrees. Two beautiful, tall, thin cypresses from the graveyard were chopped down. One by one, the old buildings were blown up or bulldozed. Local people were promised that once the dam was built, they would enjoy free electricity. In fact, 40 years after it was built, there are still frequent power shortages. On the streets in front of Ahmed's house is a great pile of logs waiting to be split mostly beach from the mountains nearby. We always, heat it. we always heat with wood. It's cheaper and more reliable, he said. A few more slides to get a sense of, you'll see now, you know, as I said before, it's a very narrow part of the river upstream from the dam where the island used to be. So there you can see at one point it's only 150 meters across. From on the left side there, the um, Serbian bank and on the right, the Romanian bank. And this is Ahmed um, on the left, obviously, and his wife, Miura. And this is Ervin Osman, who is the grandson of the last imam of the island. He often, and he's now operates tourist boats from Orshava, um, and he takes out, and quite often he says, people who either used to live on the island or who used to visit it in their childhood and have fond memories of it, want to go out with him on his boat. And I asked um, if they, how they remember it. And some people put flowers on, throw on, onto the, onto the river in the places where the um, island used to be. And this is the dam, the hydroelectric dam at the Iron Gates. <coughs> And another view, again, almost exactly where the island used to be. This is a cave um, on the Danube, in, just up from there, where people used to, um, during the communist era, swim across from the Romanian bank to Yugoslavia to try to escape from um, Romania. And uh, oh, that's me sitting in the cave. You can only reach it by boat, just by a small boat. And here, again, one of the old um, Ottoman-era castles from the shore, which was partly drowned when the river flooded. And this is the castle of Ram, again, an Ottoman-era castle from medieval times. And a view out. I was talking about the, the colours of the river before. I think it was first here first where I really saw river as a silver river rather than a blue one. This is um, Smederevo, um, almost up the stream as far as Belgrade. With um, This was actually taken by, captured by the Ottoman armies in 1439 for the first time and then in 1459. Um, it's a magnificent, one of the most magnificent islands on the river, uh, castles on the river, but part of the old walls of the castle were blown up in the Second World War. The Germans used it as a munitions storage area, and either through the sabotage of the partisans or um, by accident. So you can see the railway line runs very close to it, and uh, there was a massive explosion there, I think in 1943, which blew a big hole in some of the river. And this is Belgrade, Kalimegdan, uh, the car, the hill overlooking the confluence of the Danube and Sava rivers, where the Sava, this huge tributary of the river, flows into the Danube. Here, there's a, a rather good restaurant 
actually built into the fortress behind. And when I asked for baklava, the rather nationalist Serbian waiter uh, said, uh, oh, we don't have that here, but we have a very good Serbian walnut pie. <laughs> <laughs> Which rather resembles that. And this is the point where, as you can see with the old Ottoman uh, architecture of the fortress guarding the mouth of the river, of the confluence, and there's a ship coming out. This is the Sava on this side flowing out into the Danube, which obviously flows down in this direction. And this is Novi Sad, further up in Serbia, with the large tower on the hill. This was when uh, Sultan Mehmed, when the um, um, I'll, I'll try and I'll read you a little bit. Three? Just. Reference. I wanted to read you something about Novi Sad. This, actually, you can see the large clock towers there on it for people sailing by on the river to tell the time by. That's why the clock faces are so large. And here. Sorry, Suleiman the Magnificent, of course. Mm -hmm. the, the, fortress, the fortress on its rocky outcrop was home to the first known settlement by a Celtic tribe. Celtic tribe. They were displaced by the Romans who valued the defensive possibilities of the place. The Petro in the Petro Varadin in the, comes from a Byzantine bishop called Peter. In 1526, Suleiman the Magnificent marched with his army to the decisive battle with the Hungarians at Mohac further upstream. Taking the town, he told his Grand Vizier, Ibrahim, would be like a snack to keep him going before breakfast in Vienna. <laughs> it was not quite so easy. But when the Turkish soldiers blasted two holes in the walls by attaching mines, resistance crumbled. And I was there in Novi Sad, actually in 1999, when another battle took place, when NATO um, bombed the bridges over the Danube in the city. The next slide, I think, is Suleiman himself riding up to the battle. And from there, we reach the plain of Moash and then to Hungary. This is, you know, when I first went to Hungary in the 1980s, um, it was the time of the World Cup when, uh, and then the opening, I think it was the Mexico, World Cup in Mexico in 1986, and Hungary's opening match was a, with its old enemy, Russia. Um, and, uh, and Russia won 6-1, or 6-0, I think. And uh, I remember a taxi driver telling me that it was the worst defeat since the Battle of Mohaj. <laughs> um, this, the Battle of Mohaj, obviously, in 1526, when um, Suleiman defeated the very young King Loyosh, uh, the Hungarians were somewhat ill-prepared. Uh, Suleiman afterwards, after winning the Battle of Mohaj, he stayed around for several weeks because he couldn't believe that Hungary, which at that time was one of the great um, powers of Europe, would have fielded such a weak army. He was waiting for the real Hungarian army to arrive, <laughs> not realizing that he'd already defeated what was left of the Hungarian army. This was because King Matyas who had been, the, I suppose, the most successful, he's the most renowned Hungarian king. He had um, set up the Black Army, Fekete Sherek in Hungarian. You can hear there how similar Hungarian can sometimes sound to Turkish, mm. with this vowel harmony. Uh, and this had been disbanded by the nobles after Matyash, King Matyash's death in 1495, uh, because the nobles were jealous of a central power and wanted to carve up the kingdom of Matyash between themselves. But that meant that only 30 or so years later, when Suleiman arrived uh, up the Danube from Novi Sad, from Petrovaradin to Mohaj, that explains why um, the Hungarian army 
crumbled and why Hungary fell so easily to uh, the Ottoman Empire and indeed stayed uh, under, or one third of Hungary staying under uh, Turkish rule until um, 1686, or 150, 160 years. Just a couple of slides here. This is a, uh, a picture of um, the slain, the Hungarian slain on the battlefield. It's actually rather nicely done now, the battlefield area. I think this must be Suleiman. It's one of the carved uh, statues on the battlefield today. There are mounds for the Hungarian and for the Turkish dead from the battle. And it's, uh, though Hungar Hungarian Seymour much is sort of the beginning of the end or the end of their medieval greatness, uh, I was touched there by the way both armies are respected uh, and the slain of each army are respected. And there's some quite it's rather nicely done as an open-air museum dedicated to the battlefield. Moving up the river, this is how the, the Danube used to look. This is at a place called Baia, um, before the Danube was straightened. It's now something like 2,860 kilometers in length, though different. Um, there are different versions of how long it is, because it's quite hard to measure it. And it's been straightened it many times um, over the years. Boya was a particularly good place for catching this fellow, which is a beluga sturgeon, mm. the largest fish and the oldest fish. Uh, it hasn't really changed the sturgeon or the beluga sturgeon for uh, 200 million years. They grow to um, 100 years, up to 100 years old, and um, Obviously, it's a source of black caviar, so it's a, um, a particularly valued fish in the river. Though it's been banned, the fishing of it has been banned for the last five years um, because of the short, because of the um, too much poaching, because of the loss, thanks to the Iron Gate Dam, of much of its area, its old spawning area. I put in this slide because of the importance of sheep through the ages along the Danube, and especially during Ottoman times. I met in the Delta um, a woman who was descended from a shepherd from Poyana Brashov in the Transylvanian mountains. And uh, there, and she explained how in Ottoman times, she, her great-great-grandfather had a, a wooden passport for himself and for his sheep. And the sheep, the numbers of sheep, presumably one notch meant 10 or 100 sheep. And he would walk. It was a time of transhumans, which still exists to some extent in Transylvania today. But it was quite common for someone to walk from the mountains of Transylvania all the way around the Black Sea as far as the Crimea and come back three years later. Mm -hmm three or four years later, walking with the great flocks of sheep. And this shepherd actually I came across on the banks of the river in Hungary. Uh, the, but people, you know, unlike in this country, but like in Turkey today, still walk um, long distances in a, in a country without, which has never been enclosed with the hedges and fences that we're so familiar with in Britain. So still people walking um, some distances. In Hungary, 20 or 30 kilometers a day. In Romania, there are still people who take the um, sheep down onto the plains for the winter and back up into the mountains each spring. Among the many um, good things the Ottoman Empire brought to Hungary is paprika, which has become the Hungarian national dish. And these were um, the peppers um, I photographed in a field in Hungary, in a place called Kalucha. And, uh, and a lady here picking them in the fields and cooking what's now a paprika as a central element in the Hungarian diet to this day. On that note, um, I'd like to read Something about the depiction of the Hungarian of the Ottoman Empire in, in Hungary, because it's quite again something I've been struck with, struck by in the many years of living in Hungary. To 
talking about the Ottoman Empire. This period is depicted in most Hungarian textbooks as one of uninter uninterrupted exploitation by the Turks, which is largely the legacy of 19th century fiercely anti-Turkish historians, such as Jula Sekfu. We may search in vain, he wrote, for the positive effects of Turkish rule. We're talking about two opposing cultures whose natural relationship is one of conflict. The Turkish slave state seized victory while the traces of Hungarian <coughs> European civilization were wiped out. The real picture is more nuanced, according to Geza David of the University of Budapest, working from his own research and that of another historian, Gabo Agostón. The sudden fall in the population of one parish was often matched by the sudden increase in the population of another. The main threat to life, he argues, was not Turkish oppression, but disease, especially the plague. And when people fled, they rarely crossed from Turkish into Austrian-occupied Hungary, although they could easily have, have done so as the borders were blurred and porous. Those in Turkish-occupied Hungary may have been more comfortable than those in the Austrian-occupied part. The deforestation of the country was caused as much by the building needs of Christian as of Muslim armies. The positives include the many steam baths and the introduction of peppers, paprika, and various other vegetables, as well as tree varieties, such as the sweet, the sweet chestnut, the, seed, the seeds of which were brought up the Danube. And I, in covering the migration, the refugee crisis today, I'm also struck by that. Um, in Hungary in particular, and by the current Hungarian government playing often on anti-Muslim sentiment, today, and interestingly we also have in Hungary today a, a far-right Jobbik party which is pro-Muslim. It's probably the only country in Europe today with a very nationalist party which is pro-Muslim. And this is because the um, during the time of the conflicts between the Ottoman Empire and the uh, Habsburg Empire, the Austrians, which was obviously a very Catholic empire, the Protestants in Hungary were called the Kurds who were the fighters, the bandits, effectively, the resistance to the Habsburgs. And they often took refuge with the Ottomans as they zigzagged that border. And uh, today, the far right's website is called kurutz.info. So it's very much basing itself on a, um, a pro-Muslim. Um, and that's why it's, it's rather complicated for them in the current refugee or migrant crisis in Europe. It, the, the party, Jobbik, is, is kind of caught between its traditional sympathy towards Islam and towards Turkey and Islamic culture in general, which has also led to a very um, pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli attitude in Middle Eastern politics. And the conservative, supposedly centre-right uh, uh, policies of Viktor Orban who is playing, even though Mr. Orban is himself a Protestant, he's playing much more to a Catholic constituency in his rather anti-refugee or anti-migrant rhetoric. It's one of the things I have most difficulty explaining, however long programs I have on the BBC to explain that. Moving on a little up the river, um, and I'd like to leave some time for uh, questions too. I'd like to... Um, come up to Budapest and to um, Achik Elicia, the um, Baths of the Virgins, forgive my pronunciation. Um, this is under Gellert Hill um, in Budapest, which was also called uh, in Ottoman times the Hill of Gez Elias, who was a, a Bosnian hero from the Middle Ages and where he reportedly, reputedly was buried. And uh, underneath Gellert Hill are ten springs, and there's a rather handsome hotel which has seen slightly better times. But here you can uh, swim in the baths, um, as you can see, 36 degrees centigrade. It's one of the peculiarities of Hungary um, and if, of Budapest as well that it's drawn so many um, conquerors, so many civilizations to it over the years because the it's closer to the surf, the, um, the crust of the earth in Hungary is actually thinner than in many places in Europe. 
which means there's a lot of thermal water bubbling up um, through the surface of the Earth there. And in Budapest alone, there are more than 100 thermal baths. Um, and, this, and just 10 of them are under the um, Gellert Hill in this particular one. And here, um, the, I should add that the Hungarians didn't have such a poetic name for it as um, baths of the virgins. The Hungarians called them the muddy baths. <laughs> a few pictures here of Budapest in winter time. Gellert Hill here on the left. I'd like to finish with. Um, the Tailor of Ulm. I named one chapter of my book um, The Tailor of Ulm. And this is a man called Turgut from Ezero in Turkey. Ulm, which is the last city before the source of the Danube in the Black Forest. One of the side streets off the cathedral square leads down towards the bread museum. I spot a small tailor's shop and go inside to negotiate emergency repairs to the increasingly precarious button which, hold, which holds my trousers up. The Turkish tailor gallantly offers to sew it back on immediately, then gets into deep conversation with one customer after another. Meanwhile, I sit trouserless and rather self-conscious behind a curtain. The bells chime noon and I put my head round the corner. Are you still there? A thousand apologies. Turgut comes from Erzurum, in the far east of Turkey, where his father ran a coffee shop. He moved first to Ankara, then to Germany in 1964, at the age of 26. He came for better work and better money than he could earn at home. First he got a job as an interpreter in Hanau, near Frankfurt, because his German was rather good. Then a friend told him there was a shop to rent in Ulm. He's been here ever since, for 45 years. The Danube dilutes his homesickness. I'm glad that I live so close to a river which flows all the way to the Black Sea. Turkey, he reminds me, is sandwiched between the Black Sea and the White Sea, the Mediterranean. Then he teaches me some Turkish Black Sea dialect. In everyday Turkish, I shouldn't, I, hate, I say this with trembling voice in this, <laughs> Um, at the Unisembe Institute. In everyday Turkish, ben gidiorum means I go, but on the Black Sea coast they say ben gideriu. <laughs> ben gideriu. He has two sons and two daughters. The two sons stayed in Germany when they married, and each has a three year old child, but both his daughters went back to Turkey. One teaches German in Ankara to inspire another generation of Turguts, perhaps, to come west up the Danube to seek their fortune. His workshop is spick and span, but crowded with the tools and the finished items of his trade. There are, there are faff sewing machines mounted on the tables, clothes on hangers all around the room, and yellow and orange tape measures like strands of spaghetti. Turgut wears a grey suit, a black cardigan and a light orange shirt. On one window ledge is a vase full of fresh roses and carnations. And in the window is a big sign, we alter and repair all items. And finally, down beside the Danube in Orm, I met three young people. Two girls and a boy perch on the steps of the monument watching the river go by. Teresa and Geraldine are both aged 18, born in Ulm and thinking of moving on. Geraldine has a job for the summer in the cafe of a swimming pool. Teresa isn't working at the moment, but prefers not to say why. She dreams of going somewhere upriver, maybe to Stuttgart, to start a new life. <coughs> Erdem has a dark Turkish complexion compared to the pale German girls. He wears a black and white woolly hat from Guatemala and talks about leaving too but he would go further north to Hamburg if he gets the chance. We talk near the Schwal, a small island with a backwater just off the main Danube. From the landing stage here, from 1570 onwards, 
the flat bottom barges known as zile or ulm boxes carried people, animals and goods all the way down the Danube as far as the Black Sea. It was on the Zilla too that the famous clay Ulm pipes were carried to market, while the tobacco to fill them to fill them came upstream from the warmer lands to the <coughs> south. The last freight barge left here in 1897, bound for Vienna. Adam, Geraldine and Teresa pose for a photograph. Adam puts his arms round the girls. The Danube flows behind them with a weeping willow glowing almost fluorescent on the bank and seagulls diving in the dark waters. The horse chestnuts are just coming into bud. Three kids just starting out. An image of a harmonious modern Germany. And I think I'd like to finish on that image because you know, as we kind of contemplate the refugee crisis now and as I report on it every day from Budapest or from Hungary, in different places in Croatia, I'm struck by that uh, often Angela Merkel's comment that multiculturalism is dead is repeated by people in Europe who would like it to be dead. But then one sees, I don't know, this country, one sees actually the welcome that Angela Merkel has given to so many people traveling up the Danube or across Eastern Europe or into Europe today. And I'm struck by um, as I have been in a lifetime of living in a very multicultural Eastern Europe by how <coughs> multiculturalism is actually alive and living in many communities. And, uh, and I'd like my book to um, help to you know, add to that understanding of different cultures in Europe and of the different, many different um, cultures up and down the Danube. So thank you very much. But if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to um, answer anything. Yes. I don't understand, mm. but my English may not be very good. That's fine. What uh, it forced you to write this book? Mm. Why did you write this book? Mm. Um, yeah. As I said at the beginning, there were different reasons. You know, I mentioned um, wanting to redress the balance, that um, Europe is not, I feel that Europe is seen always from the west or from the north, and not enough from the east, how people traveling upriver would see it. So it was an attempt to um, redress the balance a bit, to look at Europe from an eastern perspective. Um, also, it's um, one of the other books that inspired it was Neil Asherson's Black Sea. I don't know if anyone has read that. And that, um, the subtitle of that was um, is something like Between the Barbarians and Civilization. As, I know, I think, I think it's something like uh, Black Sea, the uh, source of barbarism and civilization. And I quote a, a poem by the Greek poet Constantine Cavafy um, in the epilogue to this, which maybe this is the right moment to just quote a little bit from that. And I think this is, it kind of offers a perspective on Europe today as well that I would you know, feel very comfortable with. <clears throat> Why this sudden restlessness, this confusion, how serious people Sorry, I should say that this is um, a poem by Cavafy called Waiting for the Barbarians. Why this sudden restlessness, this confusion? How serious people's faces have become. Why are the streets and the squares emptying so rapidly? Everyone going home so lost in thought. Because night has fallen and the barbarians have not come. And some who have just returned from the border say there are no barbarians anymore any longer. And now, what's going to happen to us without barbarians? They were, those people, a kind of solution. <laughs> so that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> but traveling up the river, you know, if you're coming, if I'm, in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, I was trying to make my point that um, Eastern Europe is not so barbarian, or is not barbarian at all, as it's been then if one is traveling from 
um, from civilization, from the civilized East. I suppose the joke would be that one is traveling to the barbarian West. Um, but in Austria and Germany, and I speak German, and I'm, I've lived in Germany, and uh, so I was in a way looking for barbarism in Germany. But especially, there's a lot of in, in the book about the ecology of the river. And one of the most optimistic things I found in Germany and Austria as I traveled um, west was how much work has gone on in Austria and Germany to repair the damage to the ecology of the river, to the quality of the water, restoring the old oxbows in the <coughs> river uh, where fish can once again spawn. Because the Danube had been was a very central part to the Austrian economic miracle after the Second World War, but that was achieved by building 49 dams across the Danube in Austria, which of course killed it in many senses as a natural flowing river, which it is still in Hungary, in uh, Romania, in Bulgaria, in Serbia, um, in those areas where it's undammed. And what the Austrians are doing now, and the Germans are investing huge amounts of money to restore the old oxbows, some of which haven't had water flowing through them for more than a hundred years. And they've noticed that when they restore an oxbow, um, that within a matter of weeks, they said in one place that after just six weeks, they found 45 species of fish um, in that oxbow. So the fish is still there. They're just not there in very big numbers. And that for me was a sign of, um, again, no barbarians anymore, that even the Germans and Austrians are rather civilized. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes. Sorry, I'm a little bit cold. I don't understand. Just mm. ask me to repeat it again. Um, I just would like to ask you, what was the main reason to raise the water in, in the river uh, for, you know, other colleagues? Yes, for other colleagues. What was the main hydro reason? Hydro, to win hydro um, electric power. Because it's a place where the river, as you can see from the mountains on either side, it's a place where the river has broken through between, or it's carved a path for itself, so it's flowing very strongly there. Um, it's very, it used to be very hard to travel by boat upriver there, so it's a fantastic raging torrent. There used to be shallows there, there used to be um, rapids there. It was a very dangerous place for shipping through the ages. And because of the sheer power of the water there, the engineers were tempted by it, but always wanted to tap that energy. And so it was a huge project, and it has won a great deal of hydroelectric energy for both countries, Yugoslavia, as it was now Serbia, and for Romania on the other shore. And so we have to, the energy was divided between them. So that was the logic of it. And you know, in, it probably wouldn't get through nowadays, but um, the, the planning permission might not be granted or one could be sure that there would be strong environmentalist opposition to such a project, as there was to a, a similar dam in, um, between Hungary and Slovakia, the Gabčíkovo nojmaroš uh, dam in um, 1989. Um, and in the end, the Slovaks went ahead with their half of that dam and the Hungarians pulled out of it. Um, so that was that was the logic, and, and you know, obviously it has led to a lot of hydroelectric electricity being generated there. I can see that you are really into um, this history so much, and I think you're genuinely research about it. And I can feel that energy. I'm sure everybody feels that as well. And congratulations for that. But. Uh, are you planning to do any documentary or any uh, television program uh, in the future for this? I would like to very much on the Danube, yes. Yeah. Um, I recorded sound all the way, so I could already have the makings of a radio documentary. And I've spoken to Yale, who published the book, about maybe making a, an audio version of the book. Because a lot of the interviews I did on the journey, I have recorded. And I played just one song at the beginning, but I have songs from um, uh, Turkish, Romanian, Ukrainian, Hungarian, German songs um, from the whole river, and often the sounds of the river and of the birds by the river, as well as the interviews I did on the way. And so it would make a great audio book if I ever had time <laughs> to, 
sit down and edit it. But it would be nice. Well, you know, I've, I've also thought about uh, making a film about it. There is one film called Der Iste, the Iste, but it's more about, it's by a German production company, and it's actually more about the thinking of uh, Heidegger, the philosopher. Um, but he also took the poem that was one of the inspirations for my book, to come back to your question. So yeah. I mentioned there were many inspirations for it. And there's a, a, a poem by the um, German or Austrian poet uh, Friedrich Hölderlin, uh, which um, yet the river, obviously in translation, yet the river almost seems to flow backwards, and I think it must come from the east. In this sense of a river flowing, actually having it, the flow, the visible flow in one direction, but perhaps every river has a, a, another, a more etherical or spiritual sense that the rivers flow in the other direction as well. I quote in the book a Slovene geomancer called Marko Bogacnik. Um, a geomancer, um, I didn't know this, um, is someone who uses stones rather like an acupuncturist would to heal the land from the destruction of um, industrial over-exploitation and so on. And he, we had over several glasses of, of wine once in Budapest, we had a, a very interesting conversation about the Danube. And uh, he, see, he spoke about the, the Danube as a, obviously as a living um, being, rather like the Romans regarded the, the god Danubius, the male god of the Danube, or uh, as other cultures have seen the Danube more as a female being. But Bogacnik uh, speaks about the childhood, the middle age, and the death of a river. Um, but on that, the, the model of a river flowing um, in both directions is also works with that. So if obviously the birth of the river Danube would be in the Black Forest, flowing out of one fountain and two streams. And the middle age of it would probably be somewhere on the Great Plains of Hungary, south of Budapest. And then it sort of expires into the Black Sea. But looked at the other way, um, if one could see the Danube's sort of birth in the Black Sea and traveling um, up and its death in the Black Forest as it sort of disappears underground. In the, under the plateaus of the um, of the Black Forest, Hölderlin wrote about the Rhine as that other river, disparagingly. But of course, the um, Danube and the Rhine arise in the same, very close to each other geographically, uh, <coughs> close to Switzerland. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Iron doors. And now, those iron doors are they actually made of iron? That's one question. Mm -hmm. And secondly, what is the main purpose of building those iron doors? Is it yeah. to generate electricity, energy, mm -hmm. or yeah. to make uh, crossing the river uh, from that side, from European side to eastern side of the river, mm -hmm. uh, make some um, sort of uh, subject to checking, so what is the main reason? Yes. Well, interestingly, the iron, it was before the hydroelectric project, even long before it was built, the, the gorge, you know, that area where the river is only 150 meters across through the mountains, that was called the iron gates. So the gates, etymologically, and it's the same in Hungarian, Voskopu, Bottile de Fier in Romanian, uh, different, all the languages, I'm not sure what they're called in Turkish, but probably also iron. What would iron gates be in, in Turkish? Emir Kapı. 